going on? Sanders, what's going on? It's Mega Mate. She's gone from suck to blow. What? They're getting all their air back. Do something. Do something. Do something. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And today I've got a very interesting topic to talk about. And my guest here, he's coming in somewhat cold. I think he might know a few of the things I'm going to be talking about here. But mostly I just I gave him the premise of this video. We're going to talk about five excellent comic books that, in my opinion, have severely hurt the comic book industry as far as writing goes. And uh, here with me to talk about this today is my good friend, Yul Carter, from Fantastic Comics in Berkeley, California. How you doing? Thank you. I'm doing really well, and I'm looking to riff on this. Absolutely. This, this one's going to be a good video. And if you enjoy this, absolutely give this video a thumbs up. If you're enjoying the channel, definitely subscribe to the channel for your first time. You know, have a, have a look around and see if this is for you. You might like us. You might want to watch these, these videos. We do videos daily here, so uh, consider subscribing as well. And uh, there will be three ways you can subscribe to Yule Carter's uh, YouTube channel, Fantastic Comics. Link in the description. At the one-minute mark, there will be an icon. At the very end, there will be an icon as well where you can subscribe to his channel. And definitely check him out because he's he's got a beautiful voice. <laughs> Thank you, you very much. Yeah, and uh, when, but the only problem is when you see me on my show, you'll actually see me too. <laughs> I, you'll probably see him on Saturday as well. Or you would have seen him on Saturday. This is this video will be out on Monday. This is one of those evergreen topics. We don't have to put this out the day I re we record it. So here we are. We're going to talk about five what I consider very good, maybe even great comic books, like seminal comics by great writers for the most part. There's one writer I don't think is great, but he certainly uh, made his impact with his story and why I think that they actually hurt the comic industry, mostly because of writing techniques. Let's start off with, with someone. I, people are going to know this guy's going to be on the list. I'm not a huge fan of Bendis, but he certainly has some very classic stories. And the first one I'm going to say is Brian Michael Bendis' Avengers run. Obviously, I could have picked a lot a lot of Bendis runs from Marvel Comics when he was at his apex as far as writing. And what I think that, that Brian Michael Bendis, we'll, we'll say it's his Avengers run, but it's really his whole uh, portfolio of work over at Marvel, is the writing for the trades. The really extended story time that it takes to tell a story lots of chattering in there uh well, we're not going to talk about the quipping i don't i don't know if there's enough uh writers that have really brought that into their writing style but if you read a like a scott snyder one of the biggest uh, names in the comic industry you'll notice that a lot of his story arcs six to eight issues if you go and read uh tom king when he was on batman the best-selling comic book in the entire industry a lot of his story arcs Eight issues, seven issues, five issues. They're all really big. They're written for the trades. That is a Brian Michael Bennis hallmark. Even someone like Jonathan Hickman, a lot of his story arcs when he is writing in story arcs, obviously he's not doing that with X-Men, really big, long story arcs that you can throw into a trade and throw a, throw a nice title on it like that. And that is that is my friend. That is what I believe that the, the worst thing Brian Michael Bennis has done, you know, other than what he's done to Superman. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's Superman. another topic. That's another topic. Uh, Bendis was very, very um, hot and special and different than any other writer, especially at that time. It took a while for people to really recognize that he had a certain style that he was, you know, always, um, you know, utilizing. And it was like you said, writing for the trade. What it is, if you haven't read a Brian Michael Bendis comic book, is uh, it's usually six issues, the storyline, and you know that if you read it, you could probably have uh, cut it down to about three issues to get the same length, you know, and get the same story. And the way he pads it is by having, you know, long conversations that take place over the course of issues. And he does this in Avengers, and he does this in, uh, you know, Daredevil eventually. And, you know, but the thing is, is then he goes over to DC and does it on Superman, or he does it on another title that he does, Guardians of the Galaxy, you know? And it's like, I'm reading a lot of filler so that they can get either a monthly comic book out that will be put in a trade, or even worse at Marvel these days, every other week, the same, well, pre-COVID, of course. <laughs> uh, you know, two issues a month would come out. And within those two issues, you know, one of them's important, the other one's not. 
with the exception of how they pace it out. So like maybe just the last panel, maybe the first panel of the page and the last panel. A lot of recap la- about what's oh. happened prior in the prior issue. Sure thing. You know, old comic books would do that with, you know, one or two pages. This decompressed storytelling is what we're talking about. And Bendis popularized it. He did a very good job at doing it, but now we see everybody utilizing it. And even the companies with the way they put their books out are utilizing it that way, almost demanding people to write for the trade. You know, it's different than if you're reading a trade paperback or a collection of a mini series that came out. That was written specifically to be a graphic novel. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, the thing is, is like you have this feeling that the mainstream comic books, especially the Bendis ones, uh, are written for the trade. Like this is a graphic novel, but it's not. It's the entirety of the series might be what you would consider the graphic novel. I find that when you have these long uh, stories that don't have a whole lot of meat in them, I think that you don't really think of any one issue as something spectacular. It's the entirety of the run that is the spectacular thing. When I was a kid, and this might just be me being old, but I remember that one issue of something that happened, like the death of Electra. That is more ingrained in my brain than any Brian Michael Bendis long storyline. You know, I could think of like, oh yeah, I remember that time, but what I'm really doing is I'm discussing like six or seven issues that went by rather than the one issue of Frank Miller's Electra or the death of Gwen Stacy or the death of the Green Goblin. You know, two issues, you know, that type of stuff. So yeah, it's a bummer. All right, Yule. <laughs> Time to move on to my or the number two comic story that I think good comic story. People love it, but I think in the end it really hurt the comic book industry. This is definitely the least known writer. This is Brian Lee O'Malley's Scott Pilgrim. And this is the glorification of the beta male and him basically taking anything that women put out at him. They could just treat him like crap and he just keeps coming back for more. It feels like it's almost based in a character like Spider-Man, where he was kind of a nerd. Like, you can relate to him because he's Everman, but he would always stick up for himself. He would just never let himself be under someone else's boot heel. But I think Brian Lee O'Malley's Scott Pilgrim really utilized that technique. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of other writers, specifically in his age group, have really embraced that idea of this beta male hero that you can just treat like garbage. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, Scott Pilgrim was obviously very popular with ladies that would come in the store, uh, women, girls, uh, even probably too young <laughs> that were reading that. It, it's a that's interesting. I, I uh, it, 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 the thing that interests me is that usually a writer that's doing that type of book usually has a female lead. The fact that it's Scott Pilgrim as the lead is uh is the one kind of like outlier <laughs> you know you would think it would have been like the ramona story right was that her name mm-hmm. uh and you know she would have been the main character and scott pilgrim might not have been you know if it was written today there were a lot of writers that would do female leads before uh you know and they were like the main stuff but they were never putting down the dudes <laughs> <laughs> they were well-written characters. And then, yeah, Scott Pilgrim comes out. I don't know, man. Scott Scott Pilgrim is uh, is a funky book. Uh, <laughs> there's also problem, there's problematic uh, issues with that book because wasn't he, like, hitting on chicks that were younger than, like, 18 and stuff like that? Yes, he was. Yeah. That, and, mm-hmm. I mean, he's, he's kind of like, uh, he's kind of like um, arrested development, you know? He's just like a, car- a guy that just can't grow up. And he's kind of like pretty pathetic, ultimately. <laughs> he is pathetic. And that's the problem that the hero of the story shouldn't be pathetic. And I, I don't like the glorification of this just beta male loser that nobody in their right mind would ever want to be like. Like that cannot be your lead. And unfortunately, there, there are some things about Pro- Scott Pilgrim that are cool that probably could have been. Um, you could take those elements, put them in your story and utilize them like the the uh, mix of a manga in with traditional Western storytelling. Some of the art elements I I think were innovative, but it feels like everyone kind of latched on to this pathetic loser male and that every woman should treat him like dog shit. 
Yeah, it's like you said, you know, um, this can be a good thing, but then it led to all the other people just mimicking it. And yeah, uh, <laughs> who's reading comics, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it's one thing to, you know, like when you, when you are writing a character, when you're creating a character, they're supposed to be the, the um, ultimate and whatever they're doing. If it's an ugly character, they're supposed to be the most ugly that can possibly be. If they're a hero, they're the most heroic that can possibly be. This is like, you know, this is just the way it is, or at least what it's supposed to be. You don't want to, you don't want a middling character. And Scott Pilgrim is not that. Uh, it's just like you said, when other people are like, oh, this is the way you have to go. You know, it, 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 and not only that, it makes Scott Pilgrim less important or just feel like one of the same. Less unique. Yeah, less unique, exactly. And even though Scott Pilgrim has all the styles. It has something different than anybody else did because everybody else is doing it. It's, uh, it's yeah. It and that's the, the overall yeah. issue with all of these. It's when, when they became not unique, when everyone kept borrowing the worst parts of them, they became not special. And then it's just like, you see them for all their flaws. Yeah. And then that, that, that's going to play out through all these. Now this next one is maybe, the greatest comic book writer of all time. He's certainly in the discussion. He certainly had the greatest prolonged run on any series of all time. Chris Claremont's God Loves, Man Kills. Great story. Originally, it wasn't even you know released as a comic book. It was part of like Marvel's novels. It was like a little portion of like a, a novel that they put out. Certainly, the, the story is excellent. It was supposed to be Elseworlds. People gravitated to it. Ever since then, the X-Men are no longer a heroic team that go out and, and save people. And sometimes they're persecuted and sometimes clears Claremont would, would tackle that. But it feels like anybody that wanted to write an X-Men story gravitated to this one. And for now, for like the last 20 years now, maybe until Dawn of X, the X-Men have just been perpetual victims. They're always the victims. And then uh, over time, they became a new class of, of victims where they're always talking down to everybody and telling them how bad they are. You're always seeing Kitty Pride or Jean Grey at the United Nations telling humans how awful they are. Hmm. Uh, there have been some, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they still have had superheroing elements. Obviously there was the, the Bob Harris when he was editing it, it was pretty uh, carefree and, you know, it was age of apocalypse, but there wasn't really um, crazy. That was elsewhere. Well, <laughs> it was, yes, but it's probably I mean, a refreshing I, break. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like during the Joe Mad days and Scott Lobdell, they weren't going too deep into the X Men for the most part. But yeah, the when, last twenty years, you no, know, you're right, you did. Uh, when when people are coming on, they're like, "Oh man, I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to really do something awesome with the X Men." It is probably because God loves me and kills was so good at doing that in a vacuum. It's a really super awesome story, but it shouldn't necessarily be something that's like often revisited. It's been done, and even Chris Claremont has revisited it a number of times now. And it's kind of like maybe he shouldn't also uh, just kind of like reprint it and say it's a good story. But I do highly recommend uh, God Loves Man Kills. It's just if if other people come on and they want to make a statement and they don't do a great job at it it's just going to look you know it's just going to look silly and like how many issues of uncanny x-men did chris claremont write before he got to god loves man kills i don't know like 150 200 something like that <laughs> few years worth yeah. of work before he went in there and told a seminal moment like that which is a very important comic and i think it, it uh, addresses things within society that needed to be talked about in a unique way but everybody just wants to jump in and, and write god's loves man kills on the very first issue let's work up to it and then 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 you can go hit the heavy stuff but it, it just it really brought down the x franchise hopefully it's rebounding right now and I think the problem is, is that people aren't going to stick around as long as him to get to that point. So they got to no. pretty much blow their wad up front. Give it, give it a year at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, there's got to, when you start Fantastic Four, you know, it's like, you got to be a year before you do your Doctor Doom story. <laughs> got to be at least a year or two before you start doing a God Loves Man Kills uh, seminal moment, you know. All right. So we were la we're down to the last two and these probably these two writers are probably in the running along with Chris Claremont for the greatest writers of all time. You could even almost flip flop them. It's going to be Frank Miller and Alan Moore. 
I will go with Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns for going a little too ultra dark, too ultra violent. You could absolutely cut throw in Alan Moore's The Killing Joke and some of the other out of continuity stuff he did with Batman as well. Batman's a great character. I don't mind going gothic. I don't mind going dark. It especially fits Elseworlds where you can really do some crazy stuff while The Dark Knight Turns is absolutely seminal. It might be the greatest comic book of all times. I think we've been revisiting the ultra dark nature of Batman and Gotham a little too much. It's You almost can't get away with it. It's completely affected the way that we've seen Batman in the DC Comics universe on, on cinemas. E even Frank Miller himself, when he went back, I was it Batman and Robin? Where he's got Robin eating rats and stuff like that. It's just crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, so... Frank, all right, so then you, people have to realize that we were in a different time <laughs> when, like, Bat, the Adam West Batman was still very fresh in people's mind, uh, minds. Uh, you know, it was being replayed on TV all during my childhood. And so when Frank Miller is doing comic books, these are the Batman images. You know, the super friends are still out there. There's nothing dark and really super gritty. Um, Gene Colan was drew, doing the art on Batman, but, you know, it, it was just kind of like your dad's Batman stories. And so what did Frank Miller do? He told an older Batman story. <laughs> and for some reason, it freaking clicked so hard that everybody loved it. And now nobody can do anything other than the darkest, you know, Batman story ever, at least for the most part. Uh, I do recommend if you want to get a little bit more carefree, check out Matt Wagner Batmans. Those are very classic and good. And they still have spooky elements, but they are also very carefree. And <laughs> that's a way to go. But other than him, <laughs> it's dark all the time now. You know, every once in a while, there'll be like a one shot on Detective Comics with Peter J. Tomasi. I remember, I can't remember the name right number right now, but there was like a Joker at the carnival thing. And that felt like that was a fun Batman story. And the Joker, he's still crazy, but he's not the most homicidal character in the history of the world. I don't even want to get into all the stuff the Joker's done, but uh, it's just a little too dark. I wish they would have kept it out of continuity, borrowed some dark aspects, borrowed some of that violence, brought it over, you know, and up the maturity level. But now Batman's so mature, like you can't, kids can't read Batman anymore. Man, you know, uh, right before they did the new 52, there was a Batman and Robin book that Judd Winnick took over the last six issues and it was very good. I think uh, I think Rockefert maybe was the artist. I can't remember. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that, holy cow, there was some violence in there that I was like, this is the most violent Batman I may have ever read. I can't even remember what it was that happened, but it was it was shocking. I'm like, I don't know if I can actually just hand this over to a kid, you know? Yeah, Batman so, doesn't ask questions anymore. He beats confessions out of people. Holy cow. And uh yeah, so I mean if I if if a if if a non uh, an unimportant Judd Winnick run of Batman can like assault me. <laughs> so hardcore all you know, eight, 8 9 years ago. And then, you know, you, nobody really changes. <laughs> it just mm -hmm. keeps going. Uh, I mean, I'm no prude. I like violent comic book. Don't get me wrong, but. <laughs> you shouldn't get that violent all the time. That should be like special circumstance. Yeah. I mean, where's the, I mean, Hey, the, the fact that it could move me to where I still remember, you know, feeling that way is one thing, but you know, as each, you know, iteration of that keeps going on, I'm desensitized to it. And yeah. We need to sometimes pull back, make things a little happier so that you can then go back and, uh, you know, have that violent moment and you can get shocked, you know, unless it's someone's first time reading the book or, you know, oh, I never really read superheroes before. And then, you know, they're shocked into reading it. This might be new for them, but we've been dealing with this for, well, I should say people that have been reading since Dark Knight Returns have been reading this for a this type of story for a long time, for sure. Yeah, I remember I, I went back and read um, The Long Halloween. Mm -hmm. It was just, it felt jarring to me. It was like, mm -hmm. it's Batman doing detective work. 
Yeah, that There's one's certainly a good one. some violence and stuff in there, but it was just a completely different storytelling and technique. And you're right, it, it was it was jarring. Like, oh, this is really cool. It felt special because you just don't see anything like that. All right, let's get to the last one. I've obviously given kind of uh, the person that I'm putting out there. It's going to be Alan Moore's Watchmen. You could certainly put Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. Frank Miller's uh, some of his work on Daredevil, probably Born Again, deconstructed to- storytelling, basically bringing heroes down to their lowest where they're not really heroic anymore. They're very flawed individuals, feel very of this earth rather than morally heightened individuals that you can aspire to. The, the hero is no longer someone something to attain to. It, it's somebody that has an ability and kind of abuses it almost. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, most people do by now. Uh, DC at the time had just purchased the Charlton characters. That's like the question and Blue Beetle and on and on. And Alan Moore was going to do a story with them. And that's what the Watchmen was going to be. And DC was like, well, we can't have you perverting our characters that way. Make your own up so that we can do it. And that's what Watchmen is. And uh, again, you know, bringing, deconstructing characters, taking archetypes of characters and putting them through the ringer is, very well, effective. it's very effective. And it was, I mean, hey, it might have been even more monumental if it was Blue Beetle, you know, and it was the question and stuff like that. But as a result, you know, this is like one of the greatest comics of all time, or at least, you know, the most known, the most, I don't know. I, 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 what, obviously there's going to be people that don't like superhero comic books, but even they have to respect the fact that this is a book that, you know, it's, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. It's a, it's a chart, you know, it, it tops the charts. It's, you know, longest running, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's the, it's the dark yeah, side of the moon it. of comic books. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, every it it's always selling. It's a fantastic book. But, again, you know, this deconstructing of characters, that's the reason why we have this uh, Tom King Batman that is a lot of people loathe. A lot of people like it for that. But, you know, we've seen it. We, we've seen it in Watchmen. We've seen it, you know, uh, with the all-star books when they do it with Batman or The Dark Knight Returns or even in his own way, Grant Morrison with his all-star Superman, even though it's more... Daredevil, uh, certainly. Daredevil, He's like always you said. deconstructed. Exactly. Daredevil, holy cow. That guy always... It's, talk about spiraling. <laughs> his his entire arc is in a well <laughs> all the, the Daredevil time. Daredevil stuff doesn't bother me because that is basically what he... every. This happens to him constantly. That's right. just who Daredevil is. It's just everyone's trying to recreate the magic of Watchmen. Everyone's trying to recreate the magic of the Dark Knight Returns. Now, if you're not Frank Miller, if you're not Alan Moore, you're not skilled at using those tools, you're probably never going to reach those heights, number one. And number two, if you want to if you want to write the next great comic book story, you're probably going to have to do the game changer that they did with their stories, trying to replicate their success. It just waters it down and just exposes you for all of your weaknesses yeah you know this these guys worked up to this moment and not only that um you know uh, alan moore had a, a an artist that worked up to that moment also frank miller you know luckily was able to do most of the work himself but he had Klaus chanson these are like mm-hmm. industry vets that had been working for a long time you know lynn varley wasn't just you know working on it because of you know, her association with frank miller she was a good colorist you know, same thing with uh, Gibbons and Moore. You know, they're not just friends. These are like masters that have like worked in the industry forever. If a person comes in and they're leading with their watchmen, you know, we say in the store, I mean, we don't say it in the store. I shouldn't say that. We've we, you know, on your show and in, in, in conversation, you don't necessarily want a person to read Dark Knight Returns or the watchman first. But that is what a lot of people come into the store for. Oh, I've heard about this Watchmen. Oh, I saw the movie. Oh, I heard about this thing is the most important, blah, blah, blah. I want to read this book. And you're like, whoa, do I really want to, <laughs> you know, this person's going to read this and they're not going to really appreciate every aspect of it because, you know, they haven't read the Supermans and they haven't read the Batmans. But you know also that you're not going to get those people to necessarily read all that golden age and silver age stuff. So you ultimately sell them Watchmen. But if you had your druthers, they would at least, you know, read a few important books before that, you know, maybe a, 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 you know, 
you know, I can't even think of a book right now. Maybe a year one. <laughs> yeah. Just Superman for all seasons. Superman for all seasons. Black, you know, uh, Batman, the long yeah. Halloween, great introduction. Some of those, yeah. those blue, uh, yellow, white, gray stories from Jeff Loeb, Tim sale from Marvel. Those are great introductory stories. Where you're going to get the essence of the character, but you're going to get great art. Good storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. Read a justice league, you know, something like that. So, you know how like, if you're not familiar with the superhero genre, you don't know necessarily how, you know, characters are supposed to interact with each other. You know, the, the idea of a superhero fighting another superhero might be foreign to you. So, you know, this, this interaction between Rorschach and the Owl, Owlman, you know, is, what, is that his name? <laughs> I'm, mm-hmm. I'm such a fool. <laughs> Sometimes I can't remember. Is this Earth 2 I'm talking about? the Owl. Yeah, it is. Uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> Watchmen is the best and also the worst comic book ever, probably. 